Hello, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you again to yet another uh, episode of this series that we have titled Scripture Twisting 101. Today's scripture that we are going to analyze, uh, obviously because it's taken out of context, has to do with Deuteronomy 33.2. Our Muslim friends love to use this one to prove that Muhammad is found in the Bible. Here is what this scripture reads. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flame and fire at his right hand. So, guys, here's how I've heard it all the time from my Muslim friends. Paran is Mecca, and the ten thousand is when he conquered Mecca. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, so no notice here that... Uh, um, this is the English Standard Version, and many modern translations uh, would translate this. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned, upon, and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the tens of thousands of holy ones. Right? Um, but uh, many Muslim arguments, many Muslims who use this argument are using the King James Version. So uh, watch how this is slightly different. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came... Uh, he came with the with, tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah with yeah. ten um, yeah. uh, came with tens of thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So, he came with ten thousands of saints. Now, notice it's not came with even in the King James. It's not came with ten thousand saints. They say that this refers to Muhammad entering Mecca with at, at the head of an army of ten thousand. Uh, came with ten thousands, right? Um, so, they point to this, and yes, this is, matter of fact, let me just go ahead and give a, a, a quotation from a Muslim apologist. This will be uh, Jamal Badawi, um, famous Muslim debater. He says that Deuteronomy 33, 1-2 combines references to Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. It speaks of God, i.e. God's revelation coming from Sinai, rising from Seir, probably the, he says, probably the vi village of Sair near Jerusalem, and shining forth from Paran. According to Genesis 21 21, the wilderness of Paran was the place where Ishmael settled, hmm. i.e., Arabia, specifically Mecca. So this is a Muslim apologist making the claim. Now, now notice, one of those you have a real stretch, right? right? That this refers to Jesus, and it's it's referring to a small village near Jerusalem that, that this is actually talking about in order to get the Moses, Jesus, Muhammad connection in this passage. Now, what's, <laughs> what's wrong with this passage? Well, uh, might, be, might be easier to ask what isn't wrong with, uh, with this claim of Dr. Jamal Badawi and many other Muslim apologists. Um, Paran is, is mentioned uh, many times um, in, in the Torah. And let me give some examples. Numbers 10, 12. And the sons of Israel set out on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai. Then the clouds settled down in the wilderness of Paran. Right? So right. it's some place they're familiar with. Um, Numbers 12, 16. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Numbers 13, 3. So Moses set out from the wilderness of Paran. Notice this is a place where they were. There's a pl where, whatever it's referring to, it's a place that the Israelites were, uh, were stopped at um, during the Exodus. I didn't know they, were, they made it to Mecca also. Yeah, they, they must have. Yeah. They take pilgrimage, yeah. So Moses sent them, uh, sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of the Lord, all of them who were heads of the sons of Israel. 1326, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Deuteronomy 1.1. 1, 1. They should be familiar with Deuteronomy 1.1. 1, 1. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and uh, Dizahab. So notice this, is, this seems to be places that people are familiar with uh, on That's their right. journey. And watch what happens when we read it with verse 1. So, not just reading 33, 2, reading Deuteronomy 33, 1 through 2. This is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. So, Moses is going to die soon, and this is the blessing that he blesses them with before his death. So, he's blessing them, and he said, the Lord, notice who's coming, the Lord, it's all capitals, 
Right. So it, it's all capitals Yahweh. in the translation. So this that, that tells you that this Yahweh, is Yahweh. Yeah. Right. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. Now, who shone forth from Mount Paran? The Yahweh. Lord, Yahweh, the Yahweh, Yahweh shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. So <laughs> notice, just, just on a surface level here, if this is saying Yahweh came from Sinai, Sinai and Yahweh dawned from Seir upon us and Yahweh shone forth from Mount Paran and you say, Oh, the Mount Paran part, that's talking about Muhammad. Well, you just called Muhammad Yahweh. That's right. Yeah, he's, you, God. You, you, he's you, been you, elevated to God. You Muslim apologists who are totally against shirk, you just called Muhammad the God of Moses. Now, so, in other words, if you're a Muslim and you use that argument, Jamal Badawi, he committed shirk, as far as what the text actually said. He's a mushrik. Jamal Badawi is a mushrik. You could title this episode, Jamal Badawi and many other Muslim apologists who use this argument are mushrikun. That's what they are. We should change the, uh, the title of our series. Yeah, so uh, so what does this actually refer to? Well, this is their journey, right? This is their journey. They went to Sinai, they went to Seir, they went to Mount Paran, right? And the Lord was with them. Yeah, So, th th and that's God. That's God's journey, right? God is, remember, God is traveling in a, a, a pillar, pillar of cloud, cloud right? Yeah. Th so this makes perfect sense given the text, especially when you find these places mentioned in the text, uh, in their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. They're passing through these places. God is actually going from place to place in a pillar of cloud, in a pillar of fire, right. and then it's the Lord went to these places, and somehow a Muslim looks at this and says, this is talking about Muhammad. Even though it says Lord, it really means Muhammad. And even though this place right here is a place they just left, and everyone there understood what it's talking to, it's actually talking about Mecca. Yeah. And so this is so beyond ridiculous. The fact that Islam's most popular apologists have to use arguments like this right. shows how desperate their case really is. I mean, this is as desperate as, as you could get. If you're a Christian apologist, you don't have to resort to arguments like this because you have better arguments than this. The fact that this is one of their main prophecies about Muhammad shows how desperate they are to find prophecies about Muhammad uh, in the Old Testament. And what do you think? Uh, yep. Just to confirm what he said, because some will say that when it says the Lord's coming, it's not really the Lord, but the Lord's agent, like a prophet who stands in the place of God. So I want to <clears throat> hammer what he said. According to the account of the Exodus, <clears throat> God himself personally showed up in visible form in a cloud by day, pillar of cloud by day, which at night resembled a pillar of fire. Not only that, but Moses was actually allowed to see Yahweh in visible form. So if you read the Exodus carefully, you read from Exodus all the way to Deuteronomy, what you find is Israel sees a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire. They hear a voice speak to them from the cloud. That's they know right. it's Yahweh. So they see a cloud and fire, and they know that Yahweh's in it. Yahweh's now appeared visibly in it. They can hear his voice. Now, Moses was given the honor of actually entering into the cloud and seeing Yahweh in visible form. So I want to hammer, it's Yahweh himself who showed up, not simply right. Yahweh's agent who stands in the place of Yahweh. So in that sense, Yahweh came in the sense of he sent an agent to represent him. No, Yahweh himself, the God of Israel, showed up in visible form. I'm going to prove it. Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11. Then Moses went up with Aaron, <clears throat> Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, so they saw God in visible form, they saw what looked like feet, and they saw something under his feet. There was something like a paved work of sapphire stone as clear as the sky itself. He did not lay his hand upon them, the nobles, or the children of Israel, because again, they believed to see God meant, meant instant death. But God in His mercy didn't strike them dead. Also, they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. That's Exodus 24, 9 to 11. One more, just for the sake of time. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Moses took the tent and pitched it outside the camp. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. A good distance from the camp, and called it the tent of meeting. And anyone who sought the Lord, who wanted to speak to the Lord, or inquire of the Lord, would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. So whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and stand, and mm -hmm. every man at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. And whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud descended 
and stood at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord spoke with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people rose up and worshipped every man at the entrance of his tent. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When he returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tent. So it's quite clear God Almighty himself Amen. appeared in visible form to Moses and Israel. So he was with them in all these locations, in the desert, in the wilderness for over 40 years. So to say that, no, it's not Yahweh, but Yahweh's agent. So when it says the Lord will show up, it really means an agent that is invested with God's authority. That's butchering the contextual exactly. meaning of that passage. Especially. Yahweh himself showed up in a cloud by day, which resembled the pillar of fire by night. Amen. <clears throat> scripture interprets scripture. That's the way it is. Uh, uh, David, you want to add anything to this? Um, I, I, I can. I mean, I just want to point out that that the the Old Testament the Old Testament does this over and over again. It, it, it regularly uses this this language of uh, uh, of God doing this, especially with regards to, to to the Exodus. But but just I mean, Judges chapter five verses four to five. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, even the clouds clouds dripped water. Um, uh, the mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. This right. Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. So it's clearly talking about God here. Uh, does the same thing in Psalm 68 if people want to read that. So the Old Testament repeatedly uses this language of God, especially with, with, with reference to the Exodus. They knew the places that are mentioned. They know that it's, it's yeah. the pillar of cloud that's going through there. There's no one in his right mind who would have interpreted what M Moses' blessing to mean? Oh, and when I say when I say that Yahweh is is going through these places, I'm actually referring to a prophet who's going to come uh, two thousand years later in Mecca. There's no one who could have possibly interpreted it, and no one, exactly. no one, could, no one who's honest with the text would interpret it like that. But you have top Islamic apologists who tell their followers, yeah. "You see, right. clear prophecy about Muhammad." Sam, just two final points to really, you know. Dis destroy this uh, this butchering of scripture, shameless butchering of scripture. The the viewer may still want to wonder what does it mean that Yahweh came from or with tens of thousands. You don't need <clears throat> for me to guess. The Old Testament tells us what that expression refers to. Tens of thousands refers to Yahweh's heavenly host, the host of heaven accompanying Yahweh as he descends to fight for Israel. Let me prove that to you. Psalm sixty eight seventeen to eighteen. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. You have sent it on high, you have led captivity captive, you have received gifts from people, yes, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So here's again that expression being used here. Yahweh with his heavenly host, the thousands of thousands, right. descended at Sinai and <clears throat> led his people out of captivity and plundered the Egyptians, and then he ascended to heaven. One more, Daniel 7, 9 to 10. I watched until the thrones were cast down. Daniel 7, 9 to 10. And the Ancient of Days was seated, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and its wheels as burning fire. Now note verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, the judgment seat and the books were open. So it's talking about the angelic host, the heavenly Myriads, host, basically. the spirit creatures that dwell in heaven, standing in attention to carry out God's orders. God came down with them. It's not talking about Muslim jihadists accompanying Muhammad to conquer Mecca. And I think the final most important point, if Muhammad is a prophet like Moses, he has to agree with the theology of Moses. And since Muslims are quoting Deuteronomy, they're stuck with it. According to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 14.1, Israel is the son of God. Here, Deuteronomy 14.1. You are the sons of the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 14.1. Same book that they're quoting to prove Muhammad That's is a right. prophet. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. Deuteronomy 32, 18-20. Watch this. This is really a nightmare for the Muslim position because this refutes, <clears throat> contradicts, the statement of the Quran where it says, Lam yelet wa lam yulet. He neither begets nor is begotten, which is found in one, chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran. Notice what it says about Yahweh's relationship to Israel. You have forgotten the rock who begot you. Begot you. He does beget, albeit spiritually, not physically or sexually. You are unmindful and have forgotten the God who gave you birth. So according to Deuteronomy, Israel is the spiritual son of God, whom God spiritually begot. That's right. But in the Quran, 
Allah is a father to no one. He's not the father of Israel not begotten, or the Christians, and not the father of Jesus. How in the world then can Deuteronomy be prophesying such a prophet to come who contradicts the very theology of the book? That's right. So are you, you ready to uh, convert to Islam after seeing this amazing prophecy about Muhammad? Of course, ready to go know, back. This is this is amazing. You know uh, how uh, uh, our Muslim friends are willing to just pick and choose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an amazing thing that in their mind they know what has been corrupted and what hasn't been corrupted. Somehow, yeah. that's yeah, an right. amazing revelation. <laughs> and like I said, I, I I keep saying someone has to do a PhD on this phenomenon because uh, it has just to be studied. Well, thank you so much, guys, and uh, hope, of course, hopefully, everybody's enjoying what we're doing. Until the next passage, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.